be with us today uh, in our session on uh, quality and management. Uh, our first presenter today is Mr. Faisal Ibrahim. Uh, his educational uh, background includes a bachelor degree in clinical laboratory science uh, from University of uh, Illinois in Chicago 2001 and uh, MBA in health uh, care management from the University of Phoenix. Mr. Ibrahim uh, then spent the first year of his career working in uh, several hospitals in Chicago and Florida area. Uh, in 2008, Faisal uh, moved to Egypt where his assistant helped two uh, laboratories become uh, the country first uh, recipients of CAB accreditation. Uh, soon after in 2009, uh, Faisal joined the U.S. National Institute of Health uh, as a QA and QC technical advisor. And then in 2010, the American Society for Clinical Pathologists International ACBI obtained Faisal to be their uh, lead amb ambassador to the Middle East and Africa to raise awareness of the international certification. In 2011, he joined the Clinical and Laboratory Standard Institute, CLSI, as an international program manager. Uh, Mr. Faisal Ibrahim currently works as a director of quality assurance at the National Reference Laboratory in Abu Dhabi. Uh, he oversees the quality and accreditation activities in 10 different laboratories across the UAE. Uh, welcome, Mr. Faisal, and the mic for you. Dr. Faisal, I'm Mike Lusma. Um, thank you for the, uh, Dr. Sami also for the invitation and thank you, Hamid Jamal and the control room for the, for being patient with us. Uh, so today I'll be talking about emerging business continuity challenges, lesson learned from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, before I start, I would like to wish all the people here in the United Arab Emirates a uh, happy National Day. I think we are enjoying a five days um, a weekend. Okay, the objective for this presentation, um, I'll be talking about the ISO 22301 standard, which is related to business continuity. I'll talk about the lab operation response to COVID-19, and I think we've done a good job in terms of our response to COVID-19, in terms of scaling up our um, testing capacity. I'll talk about the non-technical department response to COVID-19. A lot of time we are so focused on the technical and operation team response, but we tend to forget about the, the non-technical department. I'll talk about supply chain, the facility department, and uh, finance, and so on. I think they and the IT. Uh, I think they've done a good job as well. So we'll give them some credit here in this presentation. And at the end of the presentation, I'll just quickly wrap up by talking about our accreditation journey. Um, for the COVID-19 PCR and uh, antibody test. Um, I'm very sure uh, many of you are not aware that there's a standard made specifically for the business continuity management. Um, so when, when we were tasked back in March to manage the business continuity in our organization, we found that this actually standard, ISO standard 22301, which, uh, which was made uh, particularly for the business continuity management uh, activities. Also, uh, when we look at the country level, we found that the National Emergency Crisis and Disaster Management Authority uh, in SEMA have um, very much a document which was done uh, to explain that standard in more details, which is uh, available uh, free online to be downloaded, and it has more information about business continuity. So those two documents help us a lot with our uh, business continuity activity during the COVID-19 pandemic. So what is business continuity? According to ISO, business continuity is a capability of an organization to continue the delivery of product and services within acceptable time frame at predefined capacity during a disruption. So basically our ability to continue to do our job, doing our job during crisis. Uh, or during disruption. Disruption can be a, an earthquake, can be a power outage, it can be a fire, any sort of a disaster. 
we want to make sure that organization continue its operation. And the business continuity can be a um, plan, can be uh, applicable to all sides of organization. If you're working in a multidisciplinary hospital, a reference lab, uh, working in a bank, you need to have a business continuity plan ready so that you can execute it whenever there's a disaster in your area. So disaster will happen. It's not a matter of if it's going to happen or not. It's a matter of when. Uh, BWC um, did a survey last year, and they found that nearly seven in every 10 leaders have experienced at least one corporate crisis in the last five years. And I'm very sure many of you have been through a crisis or two uh, during their career. I recall back um, when I graduated, a few months after my graduation, I, I have to deal with the September 11 crisis, and at that time I was in Chicago. A few years later, um, we, I moved to South Florida, and, and we had a number of hurricanes. We have Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Wilma, and, and during that time, there's a lot of supply chain disruption, there's a lot of stress, and, and we, we really need to activate a business continuity plan to make sure that we continue to serve our, our, our patients and our physicians. And I'm very sure a number of you have been through crises like the MERS, the SARS, uh, and so on. So we want to make sure that we are all ready for, for any um, disaster that um, happened uh, in our lab so that we can tackle it. It's, it's, um, it's impossible to plan for every disaster. So when we put together a business continuity plan, we kind of uh, put a comprehensive plan that can be catered to different type of disasters. And as the disaster is start, we can kind of uh, update our business continuity plan to, to help us meet that particular disaster. Um, so we really need to have a business continuity plan in our organization. I keep hitting the importance of having a business continuity plan within our, uh, in our system. Uh, according to ISO, the business continuity plan shall be available as documented information, and it needs to be communicated within the organization. So we have a number of documents and uh, SOPs um, and procedure available uh, in our laboratory and uh, to to help us be better prepared for, for any disaster. So I did a screenshot of our, that's a screenshot of our document management system. And these are master lists for our business continuity SOPs. Um, if I started from the bottom, we have the National Reference Lab Business Continuity Plan. We have a crisis communication plan, which, I, which I'll discuss in more detail later. We have a business impact analysis, and then the various departments will, will have some sort of a, a business impact analysis to make sure that whenever a disaster um, hit us, we are ready to, to deal with it. Um, so back in March, when we were asked to, to manage a business continuity plan, we, we put together uh, quickly a team of, of myself uh, who is leading this activity in addition to a human capital representative, the human capital manager, and another member of the QA department. And I think the first thing we've done is we, we, we did what is known as a business impact analysis. So the business impact analysis, we, we, we met with the various departments uh, to ensure that uh, they are ready for the, for the COVID-19 pandemic. So we met with the supply chain department and we check if they're, if they're ready to meet all the, the high demand of, of supplies during the pandemic. And I recall during that time, we asked them how much supplies do we have in the lab and how much supplies do we have within our central warehouse. And they mentioned that they have one week worth of supplies in the lab, and, and we asked them to increase it to two weeks because we think that that will be a good um, time for us in case of any lockdown within the city. And if we cannot access our central warehouse, uh, that will last us for a long time enough until we can um, replenish our supplies. Um, we, we met with the human capital department in terms of, uh, of, of their preparedness. We met with the finance department to make sure that at least they can pay the salaries during the disruption and if they kind of move that from home. And we discussed the work, the work from home plan. We went to the IT department to make sure that uh, they have a solid plan. If we need to ask everyone to work from home, uh, the non-technical department, do we have enough laptop? Do we have enough security in place to make sure that nobody take over our website because that's the only thing that we are depending on and so on. So the business, business impact analysis usually is the first thing that we need to do in case of a crisis to assess the risk that the organization will have, and we need to put together a risk mitigation strategy. And if we feel like the risk mitigation strategy that we put in place is not sufficient, 
Uh, sometimes we go back to our leadership team for some support. If we need monetary support or if we need any sort of strategic support, we go back and we make sure that they are aware of the short uh, faults and, and they help us with, with managing the, the, the corrective measure or the mitigation strategy. And of course, the business impact analysis need to be documented uh, because if you are going for ISO accreditation for that particular ISO, it will be uh, audited. And moving on into the operation team, I think our operation team did, did a fabulous job uh, this year in terms of dealing with uh, COVID-19. So I remember the first time we received uh, information about uh, or received the request to, to have a test for this disease. It took place back in February 4th. I think that was during the lab event here in the UAE. And within three days, we, we we were able to get the instrument, to get the reagent, and to go live. And that was a very short uh, amount of time. And then the number of samples started to increase. So initially, our molecular department uh, had four FTEs in addition to a supervisor. And then as the number of samples increased, we started to redeploy technologies from the other department. And we have a network of eight different laboratories. So we started to reach out to the various laboratories to help us with the staffing uh, of the molecular uh, biology department uh, to, to take care of all those samples. By March, we reached 13 FTEs um, handling those samples. And by the end of March, we reached 16 FTEs. And uh, our lab, we, we were lucky enough to have a lab that's uh, a biological safety level three lab, and we're able to kind of, um, so one second, I think the slide is not moving fast enough. Uh, we had a biological safety level three lab, and we used that lab to, to handle the, the COVID-19 samples. But as the number of samples started to increase, we found that we started to have a backlog, and, uh, and we have to cater for a STAT sample, we have to cater for a very sick sample, we have to cater for VIB, VVIB samples, and we thought that would not work out. We need to have an alternative solution. And I think that was quite challenging during that time. So again, we're lucky enough, our lab was big enough, we found space within that lab. And our facility management team with the engineering department was able to build uh, a fit for purpose laboratory to, to cater for all those uh, uh, samples, all those equipment. And we, we, we put together three different platforms to make sure that we have redundancy, enough redundancies in place to, to handle the, the high workload. By May, the total FTEs in the molecular department was 52. So imagine we went from four all the way to 52. So we formed four different teams, team A, B, C, D. Each team consists of 13 individuals, number of medical lab technologists or medical technologists, accessioners, lab coordinator, and a supervisor. Uh, from the business continuity desk, we advise the, the, the operation team to make sure that to schedule those four teams in a 12 hour shift. And we advise them to have a hand off communication. We don't want team A to mingle with team B and we don't want team C to mingle with team D. So they had a hand off communication. They don't see each other, they leave and then maybe 15 or 20 minutes later, the second team will come and take off and continue the operation. So each team will work four days, one, one week and three days the second week. Another, um, thing that we did, which was very good, we provided hotel accommodation for all of our COVID-19 teams. So for three or four months, we make sure that all the team members um, have the access to hotel accommodation. And out of the 52, I think they have about 35 um, individuals decided to go for that because we want to isolate them from the community. We want to isolate them from their elderly, if they live with the elderly parents. And we want to make sure that uh, we, we, we keep them with us and they don't infect the community or they don't bring infection from the community. And that, I think, worked very well. They, it boosts uh, up their morale a little bit. And, and also we provided them with free meals, uh, free laundry services. And they were uh, very much um, supportive if we need them to work for us extra time or overtime. Also, in terms of pathologists, we want to make sure that uh, we have enough scientific team or pathologists or PhD holders to release results and to review the, the, the graphs. And again, we're lucky we have a big team in a, of pathologists. So 10 of our pathologists were put in, a, in, a, in the schedule to have a 24-7 coverage 
um, and they were able to release all the results in a timely manner. We have a very fast turnaround time, and, and I think our clients were very happy with, uh, uh, with that. Um, so I think that uh, I was able to quickly wrap up what the operation team have done. Now let's move into the non-technical department. Um, so there's a number of measures were taken by the non-technical department. I'm talking about the human capital, the infection control, the IT, and the supply chain. So I think, again, I have about eight different or nine different slides to address or share with you what we have done uh, in the non-technical department area. So from human capital perspective, um, we, we made sure that we limit the visitor and the contractor to come and, and see our laboratories. Uh, of course, we have to continue with our instrument maintenance, uh, but we make sure that we schedule all the maintenance on, uh, in the, on the weekend. Um, we manage it, uh, a lab in a diabetic center. We want to make sure that we are very careful. So when the maintenance team come and after they finish their maintenance, they, they need to sterilize or to decontaminate the equipment. We initiated the work from home for all the non-technical department. And we gradually brought, we brought them back to service. So we started with almost 100% work from home and then 30%, 50%. And then we started to gradually bring them back to the offices. All high-risk caregivers, we asked them to work from home. Uh, we had a very friendly leave policy. So if we have any COVID positive uh, caregiver, we make sure that we don't take that from their sick leave. And also we, we were kind of um, helping them if they have to be quarantined or, uh, or if they're exposed to any COVID positive patient, uh, uh, person, uh, we kind of let them either work from home or take off and, and created a specific leave policy for, for COVID. When the school started, we had a flexible working hours. Uh, especially for the mothers to take care of the, the distance uh, learning, if we can, if that will not um, interfere with the, with the work. Uh, we assigned a dedicated business continuity team that continue of uh, three of us. And, and, and during the busy time, I would receive 20 to 30 calls per day from different caregivers with concerns to exposure uh, or if, if they need to work from home or so on. And usually we respond to them in a timely manner. Uh, we, we had a cross-asset uh, task force to make sure that uh, if we have an additional manpower in one lab or in one organization, it can be redeployed to a different organization if we have uh, not only techs for nursing and for other um, caregivers. And I think that was very helpful, especially uh, around March, April, May time. Uh, from attendance perspective, our staff used to do the finger scanning when they come to the to the lab, and we asked them to stop doing that, and we did the attendance manually, to make sure that we don't uh, to to kind of uh, we don't uh, have more infection control issues um, when they multiple people use the same scanner to scan their fingers. Uh, the, uh, the human resources department also uh, updated the emergency contact information for all of our caregivers, just in case if we need this information. In terms of the media response plan, because every now and then, of course, we have to publish some data, uh, we kind of updated our media response plan. Uh, we make sure that most of our data go through legal review. And part of the ISO requirement, we need to clearly specify who can communicate uh, information to the public or to the media. And we need to have a plan B as well, like a secondary, a secondary person if the, the, the main uh, person is not available because we have a lockdown and stuff like that. So we want to make sure that uh, the team is available to, uh, to talk to the media if necessary. Uh, when to communicate um, and how to communicate, we need to have the media list, um, contact list available in case of disaster as well. And what to communicate. So we prepare a couple of templates, both in English and Arabic, to be communicated to the media in case needed. And that's also part of the ISO um, 22301 requirement. In, in terms of travel measures, we have to fly, um, we would like to fly some of our caregivers who get stuck outside the country back. So we shared uh, their information with the authorities who are very helpful on bringing them back. <clears throat> we had a number of domestic travel challenges uh, due to the cross Emirates lockdown, um, not only for the caregiver, but for the samples as well. Um, I think. Uh, a number of airlines, which we used to use to send the sample outside the country, stopped flying, and, and we were using passenger flights. So we have to to switch to um, to different uh, arrangement for our logistics, and, and we have a couple of near miss where 
um, samples were not able to cross the border, but of course, with few phone calls, we're able to, to make sure that all those samples were uh, across the border uh, in a timely manner to make sure that they don't, uh, they don't compromise, especially um, precious samples. Uh, we obtain approval from the authorities to allow our caregiver to travel to and from work during curfew hours. So we, we had the permit for our caregiver to travel. And of course, some of our caregivers receive travel, uh, traffic violation, especially when they drive uh, their wife car, their brother car. Uh, so we work with them and work with the authorities to, to clear their traffic violation. Um, some caregivers requested us to allow them to travel back home, and we, we permit this usually in a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, we did prohibit any inter-office movement, so we want to make sure that, uh, that the different lab teams do not visit the other uh, facilities. Uh, infection control uh, and prevention measures, the first thing we've done, I think we, uh, we did it via in the pantry to make sure that we have a very limited number of seats. We inform the caregiver whenever possible to bring food from home. Um, also, the initial phase, when we did contract tracing for some of our positive caregivers, we found that the prayer room um, cause some cause infection, so we make sure that we, the prayer room have been closed. We limited the use of conference room, uh, and in terms of testing caregiver, we we also con we are conducting a periodic testing for our caregiver, and more frequently for our COVID team to make sure that we identify any positive cases in a timely manner, and uh, and we kind of uh, make sure that they, they get quarantine and, and get the proper medical treatment, and then they come back to us when they're uh, COVID-free. Uh, from infection control perspective as well, uh, we distributed hand sanitizer. We, we, we put a number of uh, wall mount hand sanitizer across our laboratory. Uh, we scaled up our cleaning process, our deep cleaning process. As a matter of fact, we had additional cleaners and we make sure that the cleaners <clears throat> clear all the, or clean all the, the doorknobs and, and all the areas, the pantries more frequently. And in terms of pantry, we, we kind of, most of our staff used to take lunch around 2, uh, 12.30, dinner at 7. We asked them to spread out their lunch across from 11 to 12, 12 to 1, 1 to 2, so that we don't have a big crowd uh, in the pantry during uh, lunchtime. Uh, we also did fumigation over the weekends, and whenever we have a positive case, we conduct full fumigation. We usually ask the team to cover the instrument, and then we have a, a, com a contracted company who come and do the fumigation. In terms of mask, we have mask at the entrance, so when uh, when the caregiver comes, if they don't have mask, the security person will provide them with mask. And in some area, we decided to also provide some of our caregivers with KN95 mask. Um, Areas that we feel it's a little bit congested. However, it's not necessarily they need the, the N95. We we had uh, a KN95 mask which was distributed to those caregivers. Um, whenever we receive any communication from the authority, we make sure that this communication is shared with our caregiver. So we send the email to all the staff with the updated communication, and we also upload this new information in our document management system. We did the risk assessment to the caregiver transportation because some of them, they use the company van, and we make sure that we ask the, uh, the transportation company to, to change the fabric to plastic and to clean in between uh, trips or to decontaminate between trips. Um, in terms of vaccine, I think the previous uh, speaker was talking about the vaccine. We make sure that our caregiver have access to the vaccine. So myself and a number of caregivers took the vaccine over the last um, two months, and we make sure that our, uh, our caregivers have uh, knows how to, to report all the side effects to the, to the vaccination team. And in terms of uh, our caregiver who, who tested COVID positive, we make sure that we have accommodation. So our, our, we, we put together a nice workflow for our positive caregiver. I know this slide is a little bit busy, uh, but we did uh, spend some time to work on this slide uh, I think back in March, and we continue updating this slide as the regulation change. Uh, make sure that all of our positive caregiver, well, as soon as I know that they're positive, I, give, I make that call and I inform them with their results, and then I assess the need for um, company accommodation, and if, if, if they live in a shared accommodation or if they live with the family, 
then we provide them with the proper accommodation until they, they get cleared from the virus. And usually, um, after the two weeks period is over, we send them phlebotomy to their home to collect the, the nasopharyngeal samples. And, and after they, uh, we have the two negative samples and they're symptom free, then we can have them come back to work. And if they need any medical attention, we, we share with them the, the contact information for the, for the hospitals. And the return to work also, we have a very nice workflow so that people can know when they can be cleared to come back to work uh, after they clear the virus. Our IT department it's, also uh, was very busy. Yeah. Our IT department also was very busy during the COVID-19 um, period. So they did uh, have a secure VPN connection available to all of our, all the caregivers who are working from home, and they added uh, additional security measures. Uh, they interface with the major clients uh, to make sure that the results go uh, out to the client in a timely manner. I think uh, here in, in Abu Dhabi, we have to interface with the Hosn app. In Dubai, you have to interface with the Hassan app and so on. And that was done in a, done in a very timely manner. And the SMS um, was sent directly from our lab information system to, the, uh, to all the people who receive COVID testing in our laboratory. Uh, supply chain, they adjusted the, the ordering pattern. So I think during the first phase, we learned that there's no need to do all the visa screening, testing, the HIV and hepatitis, which we used to do thousands of tests every day. So we stopped those ordering. However, we did order other tests that um, um, tailored more toward the COVID uh, patients, some of the biomarkers. So make sure that we have enough supplies in addition to making sure that we have enough supplies uh, for our COVID testing. Uh, we are identified the list of the critical supplier. We had a lot of communication with them. And actually, when we checked with the suppliers, I was surprised enough to, to know that many of our suppliers already have a business continuity plan in place. And some of them, they're even accredited by ISO 22301. And um, I think in the last couple of months, most of our staff were came back to, to office and we did have a return to work playbook, as many of the company have that. So we make sure that we have the last partition between uh, cubicles so that we don't have um, a lot of you know, infection within our laboratory. Um, I think since, since we I think the time is almost finished, I'll just quickly wrap up the last two slides. Uh, we have to have audit program uh, for our business continuity plan. So we, did, uh, we were audited a couple of months ago by a third party auditing team. And actually, we done, we've done very well because we, we were able to cover all the standard uh, before the end of uh, before before the beginning of Q4 of this year. Uh, in terms of accreditation, <clears throat> I think accreditation was very important for us, and this is a, very much this is the last slide. Um, we we well, actually I I I, I got the QA had and and we were really pushing the, the operation team to. To accredit the lab as soon as possible with ISO 15189. And at the very at the beginning, it was challenging because we keep adding new uh, instrument, new platform, new stuff. So every time we add new stuff, we have to do training uh, by by the vendors and training by uh, uh, by the TOT. And then um, we have to do all the new validation for the new analyzers. After we're done with that, of course, we're uh, waiting for proficiency testing to be available. So the CAB have their proficiency testing program for the COVID-19 PCR. We ordered that. And there's a couple of uh, companies in UK and, and Germany had uh, PT programs. So we ordered that. And after, I think after that, we were ready for accreditation. And we did go for the accreditation back in, uh, in July. And we, uh, we made sure that we secured the accreditation uh, by ISO 15189 for both the PCR and the antibody test, because the last thing we want to have is we have a result that um, have a comment that this test is not accredited. So I think having the accreditation also will assure the public that our results are accurate. <clears throat> so in summary, uh, ISO standard 22301 is specifically for, made for business continuity. And SEMA standard is a publicly free document that I encourage people to read. Our operation team have done a good job in terms of uh, scaling up their testing capacity. Among technical team, they, they play a major role in, in the escalation uh, or in the scaling up as well. So we, we need to acknowledge that. And I think accreditation is the icing of the cake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Faisal, for that wonderful uh, talk. And I'd like to thank you to be with us today. Um, our second speaker, 
Dr. Suzanne uh, Kamil Muhammad. Uh, she is going to talk about uh, clinical chemistry, uh, so clinical chemistry update of CAP uh, checklist. Um, Dr. Suzanne, 